Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Matiula. I am consultant endocrinologist and diabetologist at City International Hospital and Bolan Medical Complex, Quetta. Today, I will be discussing about type 2 diabetes management, and my special focus will be on selecting anti diabetic therapy in type 2 diabetes. The reference is from American Diabetes Association guidelines, which are published each year. So, first, we start with the classification of diabetes. So, as we know, diabetes is divided into, classified into four important types. Type 1 diabetes, which is basically around 5% of total diabetic patients are type 1 diabetic. Type 1 diabetes, as we know from the outset, the patient is insulin deficient. There is absolute insulin deficiency. And this is in most cases due to autoimmune beta cell destruction. And then it also includes LADA, which is the latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. Then we have the majority of uh, diabetes uh, patients who are type 2 diabetics. Around 90% of diabetes is type 2 diabetes. This is due to progressive loss of beta cell insulin secretion. And there is a background of insulin resistance. So initially, the patient has insulin resistance and relative insulin deficiency. But progressively, that leads to insulin deficiency and patient becomes insulin dependent. So the old terms, the insulin dependent diabetes and non-insulin dependent diabetes are obsolete now. So the patient either has type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and some of type 1 are LADA latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. That is they, uh, the diabetes of type 1 happen in 30 or 35 years of age, and that's also autoimmune. Then we have some specific types of diabetes, the monogenic diabetes, the MODI. There are many subtypes of MODI, MODI 1 to 13, and some of them are more common. So MODI is due to single gene defect. And then also some neonates can have this uh, monogenic diabetes, the neonatal diabetes. Then we have due to exocrine pancreas, due to pancreatitis or cystic fibrosis, on can also, uh, diabetes can also happen due to steroids or other drugs, HIV drugs, and also due to organ transplantation. Gestational diabetes is another type of diabetes that usually occurs in the second or third trimester. And uh, post-pregnancy, 90% of the patient will be normal, but some of them, 5 to 10%, or 5% patients per year will develop type 2 diabetes if no intervention is done. So how do we diagnose type 2 diabetes? Diabetes is diagnosed by simple tests, the fasting blood glucose, which is done in the laboratory, and uh, you need to have uh, eight hours fast. If that fasting blood glucose is more than 126, then you define the patient as diabetes. If the patient has a random or two hours post uh, prandial blood glucose of more than 200 that also defines a diabetic patient but the patient should also have some symptoms so the fasting one is more reliable then we have another test that is the hba1c glycated hemoglobin and this was initially for the prognosis of diabetes but it is also now used for the diagnosis so more than 6.5 percent is basically uh, defined as type 2 diabetes or, or diabetes. But this HbA1c is a difficult test and it should be done in proper laboratory, which is NGSP certified laboratory and according to the DCCT standardization. Uh, then we also can do the uh, OGTT test in some patients in whom uh, maybe the, there is discrepancy between fasting glucose and the HbA1c. In the OGTT test, if two hours post uh, glucose load blood sugar is more than 200, that also defines it as diabetes. So any two of them, either fasting or postprandial two hours uh, more than 200, or if it is OGTT uh, two hours more than 200 or HbA1c 6.5%, any two of them can define a diabetic patient any two more than the reference range. So for the fasting glucose, 126 is the reference range for diabetes. And between 126 and 100 is pre-diabetes and less than 100 is normal. For the postprandial, 140 to 200 is the pre-diabetes range and less than 140 is normal. And if it is more than 200, that defines diabetes. For the HbA1c, 
uh, 5.7 and 6.4 is the pre-diabetes range and 6.5 or above is diabetic. Less than 5.7 is normal. Okay, so one thing to remember is the natural history of diabetes type 2. So when we diagnose, as you can see, at the time of diagnosis, we already have uh, had this diabetes for five years. The onset was uh, for around four or five years or even six to seven years. But the, this was latent in that patient. There were no symptoms. It was incipient. And the patient now has some symptoms or is now uh, has done the screening test and we have diagnosed it. So you should understand that the macro and microvascular complications have started even five years before that. And in the pre-diabetes stage, some macrovascular complications begin to develop. So at the time of diagnosis, you should understand that we should not wait further and we should treat at the first visit and we should uh, be very aggressive in that treatment. So in that treatment, the key principles of selecting therapy is basically, there are five principles that you should understand. Type two diabetes stage, whether that is early diabetic or advanced diabetic, early with insulin preserved, um, preserved insulin production and advanced one will have limited insulin production. This is the first important point. Then there's distance from HbA1c target, whether the patient has HbA1c of nine or 10. So how much from the target is that HbA1c? Usually our target is either 7% or 6.5% when we start treating. So if it is more than uh, 1%, then you need to give two drugs, combination of two drugs. If someone has a 7.5 HbA1c at the diagnosis, then with only single drug that can be treated. But if someone has uh, 8.5 or 9%, then you need two uh, drugs combination. And in some patient with 9% and above, maybe three drugs and 10 or 11% may need basal insulin as well. If, uh, but that all always depends on the clinical situation. So then we should also understand that we should combine mechanism of actions. The, we should avoid the same uh, drugs action. Like for example, we should not be combining the GLP with DPP-4 inhibitor. So then unique benefits and risks. This is very important point. All the guidelines are now uh, focusing on this unique benefits. Like the patient has cardiovascular disease and diabetes, you should focus on those drug groups which has both benefits. And if the patient is obese and also has diabetes, you should focus on those drug groups which basically uh, will also benefit in the obesity that should also result in weight loss or at least should not be causing weight gain. We also should take the prior history and prior intolerances and failures and make a prescription according to all these rules. So the first point is that what is the glycemic target whenever we are faced with a patient in clinic? So everyone is different. Every patient is different. Usually we say here that 7% is our target if we can achieve that. But in some patients who have this disease duration is newly diagnosed, long life expectancy and absent comorbids and no complications and highly motivated patients. So in that patient, we can also have more stringent control like 6.5%. But if long-standing disease with short life expectancy or severe comorbids and complications and the resources are less and the patient is not very much motivated, so then, and, and also there is a risk of hypoglycemia. So in that patient, usually we can set a target of 7.5% and in some patients, even 8%. So it varies from patient to patient. So usually our targets are the HbA1c should be less than 7%. The preprandial blood glucose should be 80 to 130 and the postprandial should be less than 180. And according to AACE, it should be less than 160. So once the targets are developed, then you can manage very well that patient. Uh, but before that, we should understand that comprehensive medical assessment of the patient is very important. So you have to medically evaluate and also assess for the comorbidities. So when developing the therapy, you are uh, having this history with, uh, from the patient. You are taking uh, this history and then doing the examination and seeing the labs. 
and making in your mind the best possible uh, regime for that patient. So in the history, obviously, we should uh, always understand that the characteristic at onset. So what was the age of the patient when the patient developed diabetes? Since when the patient has this diabetes? What were the symptoms then? What are the symptoms now? And then how I, has been the diabetes been treated till now? So the previous treatment regimes and responses, and also the hospitalization history and frequency. Then we also should know the family history of diabetes and other autoimmune disorders. And importantly, the comorbidities. Now in the comorbidities, we understand that obesity is important and blood pressure or lipids. The patient is hypertensive and having dyslipidemia is important. And then the comorbidities leading to uh, the complications like macrovascular complications of stroke, MI or peripheral arterial disease, or if, if the patient has some microvascular diseases like uh, renal disease, nephropathy, retinopathy, neuropathy. Uh, also important is hypoglycemia and the last uh, hypoglycemia that, that the patient, patient faced and uh, what were the circumstances of hypoglycemia and how frequent the patient has hypoglycemia? Does the patient have awareness of hypoglycemia? And some other things like uh, the last dilated eye exam and dental visit and all that. So in uh, the behavioral factors, we should understand the eating pattern of the patient and exercise uh, pattern. So uh, the weight history, is there a weight gain or weight loss in that patient? and also the uh, smoking history in that patient. And in the medications, what are the current medication regime, the medication taking behavior, intolerances and side effects, and also any other uh, drugs that the patient is taking and uh, how has he been on the different regimes and how he responded to all that. Uh, in examination simple, we start with the weight, BMI, and with the uh, basic uh, vital signs like blood pressure, pulse, and also the uh, foot examination, which is the most important part in which we have to see the neurovascular uh, examination. That is, we have to screen for the peripheral arterial disease. We have to screen for the uh, for the um, uh, any ulcers. The visual inspection is important. Any uh, callus formation, and also we have to determine the neuropathy. That important uh, sign of that is basically vibration or pinprick sensation or 10 gram monofilament test. And should also uh, do examination of the thyroid, of the cardiovascular, of the fundus, if that is available, or at least refer to eye specialist. So after that, the labs. Now in the labs, HbA1c is an important test, if not done in the last three months. And also uh, we can do the lipid profile or at least prescribe any anti-lipid agent like statins, rosuvastatin 10 mg, because many patients who are diabetic are obese and will have a uh, LDL of more than 100. And that is our target that we have to treat the uh, LDL as well. But uh, if the patient can perform a fasting blood glucose, uh, a fasting lipid profile, then should do this lipid profile in which we have the LDL, HDL and triglycerides. Liver function test, if indicated, or, or if suspected any uh, liver function uh, abnormalities. And once in a year, spot albumin to creatinine ratio is an, an important test. And if the patient has type 1 diabetes or any risk factors or symptoms, then we also should do the thyroid, the TSH. And if the patient has neuropathy, should also do B12 level. So in the treatment, what is the first line treatment? Metformin was the first line treatment. It is the first line treatment. It will be the first line. So since 1995, a long duration of uh, a long experience we have with metformin. So what is the mechanism of action? There are multiple mechanisms in which the most important is the reduction of hepatic glucose output. And it also results in uh, decrease in the insulin uh, resistance. And it also results in decrease in absorption from the GI. So there's increased uh, glucose uptake by the muscles and by the uh, and the liver does not produce a, a lot of glucose. So there's reduced hepatic glucose output. How we start, we should start from a low dose and then titrate up and there should be a slow titration. So you can start with the 500 mg twice daily and then go to the maximum two gram per day. 
that is the maximum effective dose above that the efficacy will be plateaued and there will be just side effects extra side effects so hba1c lowering is very good in it about 1.5 to 2 percent and the pros are that there is mild weight loss at least there is no weight gain there is no hypoglycemia it is efficacious and it is a cost effective uh, treatment and it also we have a history of use of it so there are a lot of benefits of metformin we know that uh, there are some gi side effects but if we start from a lower dose and go uh, slowly then there will uh, the patient will not face the gi side effects and especially the extended release metformin are very much good in that uh, patient who has the gi side effects one important thing is that the patient should have a normal creatinine before prescribing them metformin what is the normal creatinine we have to understand that there is this gfr which we calculate in any patient and uh, if the gfr is more than 45 we can start metformin and if it is uh, between 30 to 45 the patient is already on metformin we reduce the dose to half but we do not start the patient on metformin when the gfr is between 30 to 45 and if it is below 35 we don't recommend it as it leads to uh, lactic acidosis, metformin associated lactic acidosis. Uh, and we also hold it when the patient has some idoneated contrast procedure like angiography or CT scan. And also should understand that around one to two days, a uh, gap is then given in restarting it. Any acute condition should, we should not start metformin because of two important reasons. Uh, one is lactic acidosis and the other is that all the acute conditions will have a, a acute kidney injury. So you never know about that. And the patient may also have a sepsis and that can lead to metabolic acidosis. So in the acute conditions, hospitalized patients, we don't recommend metformin until the patient is stable enough to be tolerating metformin. And uh, in the outpatient setting, important factor is creatinine or GFR. So usually the 30 GFR means around two creatinine or 1.8 creatinine, but you should calculate that GFR as well. What should come after metformin? What is your practice? Now you can understand in the half century, the blood pressure medications, every five years, there is a new drug. So we have every five to 10 years, a new drug, but in the diabetes till the 2000, there were only two drugs, sulfonylureas and insulin. Then we had metformin in the 1995. And then after that, in the last uh, one decade or two decades, we have a lot of new agents. And that include the SGLT2 inhibitors, the DPP4 inhibitors, the GLP1 receptor agonists, the glenides, the TZDs and all that. Now we basically can group all these drugs together and understand, uh, but before that, you should understand what is the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. It used to be said that this is a non-insulin dependent diabetes and there is only insulin resistance. So that's wrong. There are a lot of mechanisms of type 2 diabetes. The ominous octet. So ominous octet means there are eight different mechanisms causing hyperglycemia or type 2 diabetes. So the first one is insulin. So at the level of pancreas, there is decrease pancreatic insulin secretion and there is increased glucagon secretion glucagon then results in insulin resistance so there are two mechanisms at the level of pancreas and then we have at the level of gut the glp1 uh, acts on that so we have this incretin effect and also gut carbohydrate reabsorption of uh, absorption of glucose so two mechanisms at the level of gut as well and then at the level of liver there is increased hepatic production in diabetes. So the, especially at night, there is increased hepatic production, which is the gluconeogenesis that results in fasting hyperglycemia. Now also at the level of the kidneys, the renal glucose excretion is decreased and the patient develops hyperglycemia because of that. And also the peripheral glucose uptake at the level of muscle is decreased. So based on all these mechanisms, we have drugs like at the level of pancreas, insulin and sulfonylureas both will result in more and more insulin production. And at the level of gut, we have the GLP-1 receptor agonist, which enhances, uh, which is basically the incretin enhancer and also the DPP-4 inhibitor. DPP-4 inhibitors, actually what it does is that it increases the body's GLP-1. So then we have the metformin, which acts at the level of liver, 
and it decreases the hepatic glucose production and the SGLT2 inhibitor acts at the level of kidneys that is that it results in glucose reabsorption from uh, uh, it inhibits glucose reabsorption from the uh, kidneys and results in glucosuria. So, and the TZDs act on the muscles and they increase the peripheral glucose uptake. So, based on all these, there are four different groups the insulin providers, insulins and sulfonylureas, the incretin enhancers, the GLP1 receptor agonists, and DPP4 inhibitors, the insulin sensitizers, that is the metformin and TZDs, and the glucose excretors, the SGLT2 inhibitors. So all these drugs are basically given over here. And in the next talk, we will then also discuss about the details of all these drugs and how do they act and how we actually prescribe in our practice uh, when we are prescribing uh, in the clinic and what guidelines, how we follow the guidelines, the American Diabetes uh, Association guidelines. Thank you so much.